the distinction that you're drawing just now sounds kind of like a semantic distinction, not a big distinction. I'm curious how all that would cash out in practical terms. Take the issue of stem cell research, for example. George Bush cited a higher medical authority, you know, saying life is a gift from God. Um, most liberals uh, protested the, you know, intrusion of religious reasons into politics. Um, Ron Reagan Jr. actually uh, wrote a great letter to the New York Times in which he um, sought a second opinion. And rather than objecting to uh, Bush's right to talk about conscience and politics, he took his claims for what they were. And he said, well, let's, let's see how far we can go with this. Um, if you're making a moral claim, you should at least be consistent, which means that you should also be against in vitro fertilization clinics. So that's an example of how conscience can be treated as open rather than private to advance the secular liberal agenda. Austin, we touched on Islam earlier in our conversation. Let's get back to it real quick before we finish up. Uh, uh, a lot of your book is devoted to the matter of Islam. In fact, the famous apostate Ibn Warwick has called the secular conscience, uh, well, he's, he said that it should be read by every friend of the open society. Why is this book important to dissident Muslims? As I mentioned earlier, the secular open society has met its antithesis. We have the Anglican Archbishop Rowan Williams considering Sharia courts in the UK. We have a Human Rights Commission in Canada bringing lawsuits alleging religious offenses against Muslims. We have honor killings spreading across Europe. But at the same time, there are, as you mentioned, untold numbers of secular Muslims and, and what Irshad Manji calls reform-minded Muslims. These are people working to reconcile their faith with human rights, freedom of conscience, and secular modernity. The young people of, of Iran are mostly secular humanists, trapped in a theocratic mm. nightmare. One would expect secular liberals to be at the forefront of this struggle. Yeah, they're not. you'd expect secular liberals to be the biggest ally of these secularizing elements within Islam. That's right. But I can tell you, I've had the privilege to organize some gatherings of, of secular Muslims, dissidents from the Muslim and Arab world, um, many of them in the United States. And the first question that we always get is, I can see that you have your problems over there, but we have our problems over here. They mean the Christian fundamentalists, and they, they sometimes use the phrase American Taliban. We have our own Taliban in America. Well, when I hear someone use the phrase American Taliban, it's all I can do to keep from throwing a book at them, a big book. Yes, America has a noisy minority of Christian fundamentalists, but get back to me when they start killing their sisters and daughters with impunity for the crime of dishonoring the family. Get back to me when they send gays to the gallows in the streets of American cities. Until then, stand with the Muslims and non-Muslims who are working to reinvent their faith. What you just said, Austin, I can sink my teeth into, but a lot of secular liberals will hear it, and it just screams to them Islamophobia. Islamophobia, yeah. Was Theo Van Gogh uh, an Islamophobe? Uh, after making the movie Submission in the Netherlands, uh, he was shot. He's bleeding on the street in Amsterdam, and before his throat is sliced open, his last words to his killers were, surely we can talk about this. Hmm. Is Ayan Hirsi Ali an Islamophobe? Um, how about Ayah Jamal uh, He's an Iraqi Shiite cleric who's calling for the absolute separation of mosque and state in Iraq, but yet he said, when young people come to religion, not because the state orders them to, but because they feel it themselves in their hearts, it actually increases religious devotion. James Madison couldn't have said it better, but notice, this argument would be impossible if we thought religious claims were out of bounds of public discussion. Hmm. So people like Hirsi Ali and Jamal al-Din, they should be the chief allies of secular liberals, and their enemies should be our chief enemies. This means giving up the private conscience for the open conscience. We've taken for granted in this whole conversation that there is such a thing as secular moral conscience or secular morality, and that it's open and objective in the way that you describe. You want secularists to break the religious monopoly on morality. I've heard you talk about it. That's 
basically the underlying argument in all of our conversation today. But many commentators, Austin, religious and secular alike, deny that this is possible. And, of course, there are a lot of religious objections that are well known. For many secular pro-science types, morality isn't something that they feel comfortable about advancing in the public square. For them, it's just an evolutionary device that's helped us survive and reproduce. Or maybe they see morality as just enlightened self-interest. Some of my best secular liberal friends, some people we've talked to on Point of Inquiry, uh, also really seem to be moral relativists when it gets down to it, when the chips are down. Uh, on any of these views, any of these culture war questions, uh, moral values for them seem to have no independent, no objective existence. So maybe secularists just have to bite the bullet and have to agree that if if you don't have God without God, everything is permitted. I teach ethics, and one thing I can always predict about my undergraduate students is that they will be moral relativists at least until the instructor reminds them that since all grades are equal, they'll all be getting a D for the course. <laughs> Look, not only is the secular conscience possible, I say the religious conscience is impossible without it. Without conscience, secularism and religion are hollow. Without conscience, liberalism is defenseless. Conscience is the soul of the secular liberal order, and we can, we must reclaim it. Mm. Thank you very much for joining me again on Point of Inquiry, Austin Dacey. Thank you, DJ.